This is where the law stops. And I start. Hello and welcome to this edition of Masters of Boogaloo, the podcast talk show that talks about the exciting and bizarre world of Golan and Globus, a.k.a. Canon Films. I'm Aaron M. Lembert, and with me as always is... Kyle Murphy! Alright, so we're going to do this episode today. Um, best way to describe it is the Stallone era of Canon Films. The two Stallone movies. Which is kind of relevant of the time because there's a, as we're recording this episode, there's a lot of buzz surrounding Stallone. He got the Golden Globe for Creed, and he's uh, got a good shot at getting the uh, Oscar for Best Supporting Actor in Creed. But there was a time where he was regarded as one of the worst actors of all time. In fact, I think he still uh, carries the record for most Razzie nominations, and I believe these two films are amongst those. Yeah, but they're still not as bad as Rhinestone with Dolly Parton. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the, the, the fact that that wasn't a canon movie is... No, uh, that was 20th Century Fox. Nope, yeah, that was a major studio behind Rhinestone. I could could you imagine being in that being in that boardroom? All right, boys, I got an idea. We got Dolly Parton and we got Sylvester Stallone. Dolly Parton's going to make him a country star. All right. You know, <laughs> they, they, they greenlit, you know, Staying Alive that was directed by Stallone. No, that was Paramount. That wasn't Fox. Yeah, yeah, but it's still directed by Stallone, the sequel to Saturday Night Fever. But you got to remember, like, at this point, um, he had just come off the huge success. When he did Cobra and Over the Top, he had just come off the huge successes of Rocky IV and Rambo II. Exactly. And, th- and those movies made like $100 million. And and goes without saying, being the schlockmeisters that Golan and Globus were, uh, they wanted to cash in on that, so they pretty much set up two projects that were uh, pretty much a vehicle for Stallone that were another Rocky movie and another Rambo movie, being Over the Top and Cobra. Mm-hmm. And even though Cobra was... Uh, released first in 86, uh, we're actually going to talk about uh, Over the Top first, just because it's simply one of a kind. The best way you can describe it, it's the Sylvester Stallone arm wrestling movie. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's the only, the there's 10,000 boxing movies, lots of wrestling movies, one arm wrestling movie. But you know what, I think we needed that one arm wrestling movie, I think... Uh, it belongs in this world. It belongs know? in a museum. Yeah, it's just like, you know, just so we could have one. But now that we have one, that's more than And enough. they were so they were so certain that this was gonna take off that they made action figures. They did make friggin' action figures for this movie. They made action figures and they also had a little tabletop arm wrestling <laughs> Thing where you can hold on to one side, arm wrestle your opponent. Which, which if you really, it, it looked like it looked like a rock'em sock'em robots just without the robots. Yeah, pretty much. But if you look at it, wasn't that the 1980s in general? It was okay. We got consumerism. Got a, we, yes. we got a new movie coming out. We need toys. Well, it's an arm wrestling movie. I don't care how you do it. Just make toys. And the <laughs> fact that that Golan and Globus thought that arm wrestling was like. The way to go, like, it, it, it didn't even occur to them that this would be a stupid idea. I bet you five bucks, the writers of this movie, whoever came up with the idea, they were in a diner, they saw a couple kids who were bored, and they were playing arm, and they were play, and they were playing arm wrestling, and then they were like, aha, that's what was, that's what, with the kids today. Well, you know, <laughs> well, you know what, I'm, I'm actually kind of intrigued about maybe tracking down the original script Mm -hmm. for this movie because apparently um what was it Uh, sterling siliphant or something like that who wrote the script with stallone because stallone being stallone of course changed a lot of things and put his own as he he does i i I think a lot of the whole relationship between father and son and over the top is uh thanks to stallone but anyway the other screen writer um claimed in the Electric Boogaloo documentary that revolves in the entire history of canon films that this was not the movie he wrote. It was far less, in his words, stupid. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how much better like, an arm-wrestling movie 
How could, could how have been. did you how did you make this how okay? How do you make an arm wrestling movie exciting? Because it's literally it's two guys grunting it, it's, and holding hands. <laughs> Two guys sweaty, grunting, and holding hands. It's manly. It's man, you know. <laughs> and that's the thing about this movie. From the opening credits, this is like the you know the man like you know it's literally a song about America in this country, and it's like, my God, this song is bad. And it's just it's open. Well, you you got to save the good song for the end, which is Sammy Hagar's uh, "Winner Takes It All," which I still hear. <laughs> every now and then on the radio because it's sammy hagar it's on his uh best of album <laughs> red rocker there it is oh my god but the but the thing with this movie is that well, i mean the soundtrack is great because it's 80s cheese at its finest i mean it, it's a it's a bona fide 80s movie i mean down to uh the the look the feel the music the no pun intended the over the topness of it <laughs> Um, it is its title. Exactly, exactly. And and here's the problem with the movie. First of all, let me a quick, you know, for those of you who don't know, the movie revolves around uh, Lincoln Hawk, played by Stallone. He's a uh, kind of, you know, surprise, surprise, underdog. <laughs> he's, a, uh, he's a lonely truck driver who just makes his living driving from place to place, but he also makes a side living by competing in arm wrestling competitions. He's trying to rekindle a relationship with his son he abandoned years ago, while his uh, wife or ex-wife is dying and she wants them to form a relationship. Meanwhile, the grandfather um, hates Stallone's character for no reason besides the fact that he's Stallone and he's the underdog. And uh, he tries to uh, take his son away from him and raise him as his own to be a pretty much upstanding snob. Um, and the kid plays that perfectly, by a the way. A spoiled little snob. We'll go into that in a minute. So um, they, of course, rekindle, but then ultimately... For drama's sake, break apart again. Lincoln goes to Las Vegas to compete in the big national arm wrestling tournament. Which has a surprisingly small turnout. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go figure. Arm wrestling tournament. Small turnout. Um, he competes. His son is there to cheer him on, having a change of heart. And uh, he wins the competition and he wins his son back. And they drive off into the sunset um, with their new trucking company, Hawkinson, and and credits roll here. So with that being <laughs> said, my number one... You put that so eloquently. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the thing is, with that being said, with all that going on in one movie, the movie really does not know what it's trying to be. Is it trying to be a father and son movie? Is it trying, as in a father and son drama... Is it trying to be a trucking movie about trucking, or is it trying to be an arm wrestling movie about arm wrestling? Because they do all three, and none of them right. <laughs> if, if, if you can get it's, arm wrestling wrong, they they achieved it. It's not. It's it's just trying to be an America movie. It's America movie because made by two Israelis. <laughs> but but it's it proves you know what they thought. What it's like. Okay, what what do the American kids want to see today? It's like they want to see they like arm wrestling. Is that like pro wrestling? You know, it's like wrestling, but with your arms, you can see the struggle and and the push and the pull of of drama, and it's gonna be epic, Stallone. It's, if you look, okay, here's the thing with any you know, what, go, there's two types of canon films. There's the straightforward kind, and then there's the mashup movie, which is, okay, we're going to take this and mix it with this and mix it with that, and it's going to make something brand new. <laughs> it's like they say It's like they say in the document, they talk about Ninja 3, The Domination. Okay, we're going to take Flashdance, The Exorcist, and a ninja movie. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean that, 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 that was kind of like their motif, you know, take whatever worked and then just put it together with something else that worked, and then you just get this kind of hot mess of what the the thing with over the top? I mean, I'm not a particular fan of over the, in terms of like the canon film library. It's pretty low on my list, but because it's low on my list because when it's dull, oh my god, it's dull. It is boring, and the kid doesn't help. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but the thing with 
the movie is when it becomes like 80s uh, cheese and it becomes like uber exciting. That's when it becomes like an 80s movie. It's like, yeah, that whole final thing and, and the the score by Giorgio Moroder helps. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. I want to talk about 80s synth. You know, just like, Ugh! and, you know, of course we have to have our Ivan Drago, you know, who comes in the form of this big, burly, bear type guy. You know, who's like, you know, hey, man, let's do it. You know, do it now. You ain't got a prayer in Vegas. You ain't got a prayer in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, he starts imitating it. You're not imitating it. Intimidating him um, pretty much from it's the easy get-go. Imi- it's easy to imitate him. Dude, you go, come on! <laughs> I mean, yeah, you got Jeep Swinson just, you know, <laughs> really intimidating Stallone from scene one almost, like right off the bat in the movie. Uh, one of the... Overall, I think the movie is pretty harmless. In I mean, there are a ton of harmful canon films, and we will be talking about them in other episodes, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. But um, th- th- as far as this one goes, this this one was pretty harmless to me. You can tell they were riding the coat ha- uh, coattails off of Rocky IV. It was a really big success, and it was laced with 80s you know, pop culture mm-hmm. With the robot and just the overall look and feel of the movie. So they, they were trying to follow that success. They had Stallone. They got him for an unprecedented $12 million, $12 million to be in this movie. That's half the budget. And, of course, Menachem Golan himself directs the movie. Well, speaking of budget, this movie cost $25 million. I think half that budget went to Stallone in terms of paycheck. He, because yeah, he, he signed a... He signed a twelve million dollar deal, and and some actually some analysts say that he actually got more. But as oh, far as like it, he's yeah, as far as like the record books go, he got uh, about twelve the, million. And it's uh, and that's the perfect way to describe this movie. It's a paycheck movie. It's, exactly, and, and it's you, a paycheck movie. You can see movie. it in Stallone's face. He's very. I wouldn't he's, say I wouldn't say phoning it in. He's but, on autopilot. Yeah, I mean, you can tell this isn't a challenge for him that he's done this kind of movie before. Maybe not specifically arm wrestling, but he's done this kind of movie before. You know, it's uh, it, like even at the end of the movie where they have that big, you know, as usual, you know, before the final fight, you have to have the final fight talk, which is you know the pep talk. The pep talk. You have the, to have the pep talk before the final the fight. Go in for every, it. Yeah. In Every sports movie, there is a pep talk. You just, you know, it's in... I mean, but but you gotta hand it to Stallone. Um, He made an entire career playing the underdog, and not just the Rocky movies, and all the Rocky imitators that he did, including Over the Top. And he's still cashing in on it. He's about to get... He already got the Golden Globe, and I'm pretty sure he's about to get the Oscar for it. And if he doesn't, you're listening to this post-Oscars, sorry for my prediction, but (laughs) I think he's gonna get it. So I think he'll get he does too, underdog to a T. He's exactly. made an art form out of it. He's made a career out of it. But when he is phoning it in, you can tell he is he's phoning, phoning it, in. it in. Yeah, he's he is on autopilot. You can tell when any actor's doing it. His eyes are glazed over. He's not. He doesn't believe that. That's the worst part about it. He doesn't believe in what he's conveying. So you, as the viewer, don't believe it in return. But he is so much better than the kid that plays opposite him because, my God. Right. I mean, it's hard to find a good, successful child actor, especially in the 80s. But, yeah, um, this... That wasn't Corey, the Corys. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they, they didn't get one of the Corys, Feldman or Haim. They were too old. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, this one... Um, it He is, like... And he was in a couple other canon films. He was in Going Bananas. Which I'm sure we'll tackle. If we can find it. Um, Because, and that's like the monkey movie. They were like, we're going to make this movie, you know, this monkey movie and everything like that. He, you know. But the thing is, is that with his character, his character has like the quickest arc. It's like, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. End of the movie. Oh, I love you. I'm going to steal a truck and go find you. (laughs) Well, I mean, well, the thing is, it's like throughout the course of the movie, you can tell. Again, in, in most of the movie, you think it's one movie, and then it just turns on a dime to something else. I'll talk about that in a little while. But he does rekindle the relationship with him. Mm-hmm. And spoiler uh, spoiler alert about this movie. However, the movie is 19 years old now. He wins. So if you, so if you haven't seen it, you know, shame on you before listening to this podcast. Um, he does rekindle the relationship with him. 
they you look like they're going to live happily ever after. And by the way, it, it also, as another movie genre, it's also a road trip movie. This goes along with the whole trucking aspect of it. And they're, they're driving to see uh, his uh, terminally ill wife, in the case of the kid, his mother. Um, and they don't make it in time. Again, spoiler, they don't make it in time. She passes before they get to him. And that's when the son has a total breakdown and turns his back, we think, or led to believe, uh, permanently on Lincoln um, because if he had gotten on a plane to get to the hospital, he would have seen his mother before she had passed, but instead he got into the truck with his dad and it took a few days for them to get there, so he blames him for her death. It's but not, it's but not, then it's you not wouldn't until, have the plot. Exactly, <laughs> but it's not until the kid goes to his grandfather's house and finds all the letters that Lincoln supposedly had wrote him over the years that he never saw, realizing that, you know, Robert Loja, who <laughs> plays the grandfather, is the bad guy if you hadn't already figured it out by this point. And, you and, know. He's, a ter- and he's a terrific actor. And, again, unfortunately, one of the many that we've lost in the past couple months. He passed away in December. Yeah, but it's been brutal. It has. And the, the thing with him is his character is so one-note. It's... I, oh, I hate Lincoln, you know, because he's, you know, he's not up to my standards. And it's just very, like, it, it mind blow. It's like everybody's on autopilot. And and, and as you were saying before, the, the kid, uh, play uh, Michael, um, played by uh, David Mendehall, um, is probably the weakest link. I mean, can you blame him too much? I mean, he is a child actor. Has he done anything else besides those two canon movies? I really don't know. The only thing I know him from is this and Going Bananas. That's about it. Um, but he did get the uh, worst supporting actor for this, <laughs> and that is rough for a child at the 8th Annual Raspberry. Could you uh, Could you imagine being a kid actor? Yeah, I mean, I... I, I got nominated for an award. What is it called? It's our Golden Raspberry. You know, for Over the Top, the arm wrestling Stallone movie. I mean, if I was a child actor, I'd pretty much hang it up after that point, too. Um, and he got it better than Jake Lloyd from Star Wars Episode 1. But as we said before, <laughs> but as we said for before, Stallone is also privy to the raspberries. He got nominated for Over the Top. He well, lost. He lost to Bill Cosby for Leonard Part Six, which it, deservedly so. But um, I'd rather watch this than Leonard Part Six. Agreed. Um, but but anyway, yeah. My my overall uh, issues with this movie is that it really it's juggling a lot of different genres doesn't know what it really wants to be and it fails at all levels is it a trucker movie is it a father son movie is it an arm wrestling movie it's is america. it a road trip movie it's america movie because it's like okay what do what what's america what's america you you almost as you watch through the course of the film if you're not bored and somewhat intrigued by the family drama that's in it by the, by the time you get to the arm wrestling tournament in Vegas, you've almost forgotten that it's an arm wrestling movie, and then it hits you like a truck, no pun intended, with this movie, that, oh my god, this is an arm wrestling movie, because it's so overblown and so ridiculous. Which, it, it would have just been better if they focused on that and not the family stuff, because when the, fam- the family stuff is so boring, it's so dull, and... It's so... Yeah, but can you really blame them? I mean, like, how long can you push an arm wrestling movie? You know how long I mean? can you push a boxing movie? You know? I mean, g- g- good point. I mean, but I think boxing has a little bit more drama than arm wrestling. I mean, arm wrestling... Well, granted, boxing, yeah. Boxing, you know, supposedly you're supposed to go 12 to 15 rounds if you don't knock your opponent out. Yeah. Arm wrestling, you're done as soon as the other guy gets tired, yeah. as in his arm gets tired. Um, so, I mean, yeah, to stretch that out, and, I mean, they even tried to do training montages with arm wrestling with the weights in the truck that oh he sets God, up. Oh, my God, that was like, so... Doing one-arm pull-ups off the side of the truck. It, it reminds me of the <laughs> guy from... This movie is full of montage. Well, yeah, I mean, it reminded me of the guy from Lady in the Water who only works off one half of his body. I'm like, that's yeah, it. Like, got, you got that from Over the Top Shyamalan. That's like, you know, and, and the... Spe- and, well, speaking of, you know, montages, this movie is full of... America, because it's full of product placement. Oh, yeah. He's dry, and the joke, you know, the joke I love to make is, you know, when he's doing the exercising with his kid, they're doing all the Karate Kid stuff, and he rips off the other sleeve of his military jacket, 
<laughs> you know, to make it look hip and badass. Yeah, I mean, you know, and here's this $500 military jacket I'm sure your grandfather paid for. And I made it about 250 now because the <laughs> sleeves are missing. But, but, you know, you look badass. But so. it was badass because it's the 1980s and it's hip. I'm training you um, like a trucker. You know? But you look at the side. He's driving the brute. He's driving brute cologne. Yeah, that's the that's the truck that Lincoln <laughs> so all I can think of is brute cologne. All I can think of is, you know, you know, if we rework this a little, this could, you know, fall out from the whole thing in Rocky too, where, you know, sm- uh, I'm Lincoln Huck and I use brute to smeal mainly. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what they wrote on the side of the truck, too. Brute Cologne, Smeal Manly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stallone totally uh, turned his back on Beast Aftershave you know, with Brute come 1987. He's a Brute man. He's, yeah. also, he's also a Colgate man. But, you know, it just goes to show you pay Stallone enough. He, his allegiance is to the dollar. <laughs> but that leads into, so... So overall, so, yeah. So overall, over the top. Um, one last thing I want to comment before we give our overall ratings is, um, is as I was saying, when it finally does hit the fan and turn into an arm wrestling movie, it just gets really ridiculous. You know, you got sweaty bulk guys, and and you know, in some of the aspects of the movie do work in it because they really play up the humor. You got the one scene with the guy. Um, chugging gasoline because it gives him some kind of edge over his opponent. <laughs> then literally the next clip of the same guy, he's like popping Alka-Seltzer. And oh, like, shit, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah, and, and then I'm convinced, you know, it could be the Giorgio score, but when you get to the final match, it sounds like pl- sirens in the background. And I'm like, oh, that must be the guy who chugged the gasoline. <laughs> He spontaneously combusted. Get it, Ow! Get that man to a hospital. How? He had chili peppers. But, you know, there's <laughs> there's the humor with that at the ending and also the humor where they do, like, the ESPN on-camera interviews with all the, you know, uh, component uh, the the competitors. And they're all taking it so seriously. They're just taking it so calm seriously. They, just nothing but pride and integrity in their face. And then it I am a man because I arm wrestle. Look at my muscles. It's like, I want to beat him until there's nothing left of him. Just total, total macho intimidation. I want to beat him. Get him off the table. And then you cut to Stallone. He's just like, I just want the truck. <laughs> if I have to arm wrestle to do it, I'll, I'll arm wrestle. I really that's all he cares about is his truck. He, that, well, that's I mean, yes, I, that's how Lincoln Hawk makes his living. But uh, but like I said, um, the the ending is really ridiculous, especially when you go from the close ups and it's all intense with the lighting. Close up, they're sweating, and they actually managed to get Stallone to bleed. They had to do a, like a weird. Kind he has of, a nosebleed. Yeah, it's like, it's like it's like we got to get him to bleed. He's Rocky. He's got to bleed at the end. So they managed to work that in where the guy makes him hit himself. Um, but then you you go cut to a wide shot with all these intense close ups and you see it's just guys standing around like almost bar table tops <laughs> arm wrestling and you're like wow and there really isn't much of a turnout. But is that any worse than a poker tournament where literally it, it, that's it, all people are doing it's is almost, sitting at a table? It's almost along the same lines as a poker tournament. I'm I'm not sure which I would rather to see honestly. I mean, I. There are bit, the things I like about Over the Top. I like the soundtrack. The soundtrack is Edie's Cheese. And when it gets finally gets to the arm wrestling part, when you just slug through all this family drama, you know, when he, you know, bursts through the gate with his truck and he gets arrested, you know, by the evil grandfather. Which all he does is get arrested, you, you know, know. And everything like that. It's just like... You know, and then when you get to the arm wrestling parts, it's like, wow, this is exciting. It's stupid, but it's exciting. And it's like, why couldn't have this been the move? Like, why couldn't it have been? And, and you want to talk about bad character arcs. So, I mean, take a look at the grandfather who just for no reason besides that he's Stallone, the underdog, just despises Stallone's character, Lincoln. And, uh... You're not and, rich enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For the reason that he's not rich enough, pretty much. And, um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of resentment for abandoning his wife and child, which was his child, his daughter. Now she's dead, and he feels that he he is almost, like, owed the satisfaction of raising her son, you know, because mm-hmm. he was he's the one who's been doing it, being, like, the father figure in his life when uh, Lincoln Hogg, Bad. Yet some father figure who leaves his kid back at the house to go and 
you know, to go to Las Vegas to be like, you know, stay out of our lives. Here's 500 grand and a new truck. Just get out of here. Meanwhile, across, you know, meanwhile, across town, the kid steals a truck. Yeah, and, 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 dr- and, and they somehow, that- without being caught by the cops, without getting pulled over, somehow gets to the arm wrestling tournament on time. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he gets there on time just to give Stallone the pep talk and he wins day. And But the thing I'm, I'm, I'm making the point with the grandfather, he does the worst character arc I've ever seen because he makes it down to Las Vegas. You know, yep. they're all there to see uh, Stallone pull this off. And uh, once he does, it cuts to the grandfather and he's like, he's the, the crying. Man, the, yeah, the man who for just absolutely hated and despised this man, looks on him with tears in his eyes, he's like, you know what? He's not that bad. He reminds me of me. Yeah, <laughs> before I made my money, I was an arm wrestler too. Uh, okay, so yeah. Um, That's the prequel we'll never see. Yeah, but you know what? I, I, maybe I'll write it one day. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's time, America. Maybe we need another arm wrestling movie. Well, you know, we got... <laughs> so, so to wrap up over the top, um, I'm going to say... It's ridiculous, it's confused overall on what it's trying to be, and you know what it's trying to be, but just doesn't succeed. Um, But overall, in terms of the whole canon universe, it's pretty harmless. It's... The soundtrack is good when it's over the top, it's over the top. It is its title. Um... And when it has its funnier moments, it is entertaining, but it doesn't get fully entertaining until about the last half hour. Until then, you're trudging through montage after montage, and you're trudging through, you know, really bad child acting. No offense to the but, actor. But, 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 but it is a staple, I want to say. Like, if you, if you have a need to kind of, like, really study on whether it's either the Canon Films Library or even Stallone's uh film library it is something it is a, a entry that you can't overlook it's america you, you got to see it to believe it's it it's full of grease and testosterone and just muscles and it's america and what more to say than uh winners take it all and losers take the fall <laughs> All right, and continuing with the whole Stallone era of canon films he did make two movies and the other one being 1986 Cobra, the one that predated uh, Over the Top by the good year. one. Yeah, it's regarded as the good one, though also the forgotten one. I think um, I think Over the Top stays a little bit more in the public conscience than Cobra does. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know where you have Over the Top is to Rocky. Cobra, I guess, would be to Rambo, even though he's not a military guy; he's a cop. But it's that still kind of action. He does the job nobody wants. That's right, <laughs> the zombie squad. So the first thing I want to say about Cobra, I guess, is that I actually enjoy the movie. I, I, I Same ha- here. I have, like, little um, criticisms of it only because I know what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a kind of turn-off-your-brain action movie of the cop genre. Um, and it succeeds, and it, and it succeeds on a level of being, like, a pure 80s action movie it's almost like a comic book in some ways. I mean, you got a villain named Night Slasher <laughs> who just wears, you know, leather jackets and has custom knives and has an occult behind him where their symbol is clinking axes together in the air and you have big-haired Bridget Nielsen mm-hmm. as the love interest before she became freaking... Clink, clink. Clink, clink. We're evil. Clink, yeah, exactly. clink. Clink, clink. Bridget Nielsen before she became hideous and... uh Oh, come on. Now that's mean. Uh, you know. That's mean. Come well, on. Well, she can come on the podcast and defend herself if she wants. I dare you to make that happen. Yeah, she, she wants to call in or something. I, you know. I dare you to be like, excuse me, miss. And I'll be like, why did you do this to yourself? Was it Flava Flav? <laughs> but I digress. I digress. Um, yeah, yeah. Back in the day, I used to be a really big fan of Cobra. In fact, in my adolescence, I made two internet sequel 
movies to Cobra. Cobra 2 and Unleashed Cobra 3, which ultimately became Unreleased Cobra 3. <laughs> but yeah, I, w- I was really into Cobra in my youth. I was in one of them. I was in the one you that were, didn't yeah. get released. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe, the, you know, that's why. But hey, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm Don't kidding. make me punch you. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm giving him the evil glare. Just so. so, when I like to talk about a movie, I usually like to look up the history of the movie and mm-hmm. like the production and what it was like making the movie just to kind of, you know, almost see how the movie turned out to be. And, th- and this movie did have um, some issues in regards to production. First of all, for those who don't know, Stallone was supposed to do uh, Beverly Hills Cop before Eddie Murphy yeah. came to the table. Um, but he didn't want to do the comedic aspect, so when he rewrote it... As Stallone does. Yeah, because he has to rewrite everything. Yeah. Um, he basically took all the humor out of it, and Paramount's like, eh, we want like a more humorous movie, you know, we're going to get Eddie Murphy in. So Stallone Lord dropped out, and he took his ideas for Beverly Hills Cop and incorporated them into the Cobra script, yeah. which is also based on a Paula Gosling novel, Fair Game, yeah. which was made into a movie years later. With uh, William Baldwin and Cindy Crawford. Right. But you got to think, it's like Cindy Crawford, which I've seen. I've seen it. And it's a it's a 90s movie, same way Cobra is an 80s movie. But I think what makes Cobra more memorable is it has a lot of that over-the-topness that comes from a Stallone movie. Because there's, Stall- there's two types of Stallone movies. There's the really good, like, serious... You know, very melodrama. Melodrama. You know, very er, uh, earnest. You know, humble kind of acting. And then there is the, I'm gonna go blow shit up. And, and, and that's what Cobra is. And that's and you know, I'm gonna go blow shit up and kick some ass and spit out some one liners. Absolutely to a T. I mean, like, everything about it is like just to sell popcorn. Exactly. And I here mean, and here's the thing: what makes Cobra more memorable than Fair Game is. Fair game, it, it tries to be that, and it fails. Yeah. Because, okay, William Baldwin, I love you. You're one of my favorite Baldwin actors, but, like, not action, like, Baldwin. action star. You mean there's more of them? <laughs> yes, there are. There's William, like, if we're ranking, ranking uh, acting-wise, there's Alec, there's William, there's Daniel, and then there's Stephen. <laughs> right. well, we're not going to make this a podcast about the Baldwin brothers, um, but... I mean, but to get to my point, that's like, you know, that was a more serious adaptation of the novel. That, that was this, a more, more faithful. This one was loosely based on the novel. However, it was enough so to give it a credit. Mm-hmm. At least a, a based on yeah. credit. Um, Which should have just said inspired by. And the thing with this movie is it really did ride uh, the coattails of um, 85's Rocky IV... Um, even more so than Over the Top did, even though it's a completely different genre movie. Mm-hmm. It, it's not a sport movie. It's not an underdog well, movie. Well, it's not the first but, time that but, Stallone has done a cop movie because he also did uh, Nighthawks. It's true. It's true. But um, this one was definitely, I mean, you, you have the co-star in Bridget Nielsen, who they were actually dating at the time, hence why she's even in this movie. Um, she, of course, was in uh, Rocky IV. And then you also have, like, the the montages and the Robert Teppert songs with robots. I mean, <laughs> I, I, like, I, I can't really, I can't really not draw a line between two movies going from, especially the one right after the other with Stallone going from Rocky IV to Cobra. Um, but, uh, it's one of those things, like, if you really look at, like, you know, kind of to bring up the whole montage thing, that was the big, you know, every movie in the 80s had some kind of montage, just because yeah, it was... I mean, it was the, the joke that I'm still hearing, you know, the whole Team American joke, the song. Or that's that. going to montage. Yeah, that thing that just won't die. Even Rocky oh. had a montage. E- e- yeah. Um, but the thing with that is, it, th- that's funny, just because as you know, a little parody song, but, uh, you know. the The thing with the whole montage thing is, like, Every movie that Stallone was in had some kind of montage. It had some kind of, you know... Whether it's a training montage you know, or... Training uh, with his kid, you yeah, know, bonding or, with his kid, trying to find a killer. Or finding himself, kind of know, self-reflection montages. And, yeah, him on top of the, you know, drug, oh, you know. That was definitely his uh, M.O. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, getting back to the whole concept of the movie is... 
it's just a it's your basic cop movie. It's yeah. it has all the tropes. It's I'm a badass cop who doesn't play by the rules. Why? Because I can. I mean, in, in talking about like doing an analysis on the movie, there's not really much to go on. It's exactly. an eighties cop movie. It's you know pre Die Hard. Uh, you have an over the top villain. You have an uh, you know a one liner spouting tough cool guy. Wears, Some of the worst one liners. Wears sunglasses at night. You know, good guy, good cop rather. Who you know is plays by his own rules. He's the definition of loose cannon. No pun intended. I throw um, the book out the window. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of a movie, it's, it's pretty much that. One thing I, the thing I really want to talk about is, like, the production that went into this movie, because I guess it did have a troubled production, and it had an even troubled uh, post-production in terms of editing the movie. For those of you who don't know, this movie was severely edited, um, because when it was first given to the MPAA, it received a hard X rating for its violence. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of see that in some of the more, uh, grotesque scenes with, uh, especially, uh, Brian Thompson's character, Night Slasher, the main villain yeah. of the piece. You can tell the editing is a little bit watered down. They do a lot of quick cuts before you can really see anything. Well, that was the MPAA's MO in the 1980s. It was... They were highly cracking down on movies that were heavy into violence. Um, and a lot of movies severely got cut because of it. it, it like, just look, like to kind of use an example to compare Covert to another 80s cop action movie, RoboCop was severely edited. Oh, absolutely. That because that had a ton of violence. And if you watch the director's cut, which is... Why, you know, widely available now, even more so than the original theatrical version. There's a difference in the violence. It's more rough and it's bloody and it's gross and it's disgusting. And that's what I could imagine from the descriptions I've read of the scenes that got cut from Cobra. But, but because the original cut of this movie was two hours, right? Yes, and then. What they did, and of course, with a two-hour movie, you can only fit so many. I mean, so they sent it to the NBA, got X, and they're like, "All right, we got to cut some of this down." So they took a two-hour movie in order to just squeeze that one extra showing in. They cut a two-hour movie down to eighty minutes. And Canon is pretty notorious for doing that. Uh, the main one coming oh. to mind is Superman Four, of course, which um, we'll deal with on a later uh, episode. That's an entirely new episode. <laughs> that's going to be very interesting. You want to hear that one. Um, but yeah, that, that is something that Canon's pretty notorious for doing. And also you, you bring up RoboCop and the over exaggerated violence in that one, that, that was done more satirical. Mm -hmm. I think the ones in this one was done more on a visceral kind of realistic level. Yeah. But at, at the same time, it's, it, it, you know, again, this is pre what I would call like the serial killer craze in the 1990s with like. You know, Silence of the Limbs and I mean, Seven. I mean, and and we want to talk about the antagonists in Cobra. It almost plays like it's a, a comic book. The guy's name is Night Slasher. I mean, <laughs> and, and well, that's one of the things. Can't we just call him Bob? I know. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah. I think, but that's a part of the charm of the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it really, is. It's really not a movie that's supposed to be taken seriously. It's really, this is a This is one of those Stallone movies. It's like, are you really, are you really, really looking for you know, the existential, what is life? What is the, what is life? What is, you know, reality? You don't go into this movie asking for that. You go into this movie going, okay, Stallone, are you going to kick the bad guy's ass? Yes, and I'm going to blow him away. Yeah, it's like Stallone. Literally, Stallone. Stallone. Some we, we need you, you know, wielding machine guns, wearing sunglasses at night, and, you know, using a matchstick for a toothpick. I mean, that, that's what sells popcorn. That's exactly <laughs> what we get in this movie. That's what the Expendables did. The expend like, and if he almost look, cashed in on that. Exactly. And, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, one, one of the things about this movie um, is that during the production, I guess, um, Stallone was not the most liked guy on set. Um, I, I've read things where uh, he... Uh, Can't be he, as he, bad he, as... He, he, demanded, uh, he demanded, you know, things to be reshot and uh, totally redone, even though they were well into the can and mm -hmm. done with, but he just demanded it to be sh uh, shot and making things very dis uh, difficult for him. Um, also, there was a thing, I guess, where um, a supporting cast and extras were for 
forbidden to talk to Stallone. You know, I mean, he, he, this was, I guess, at a time in his life where his... I'm doing my method acting. I am Cobra Leave me alone. I, well, I don't think he's a really a depth ma- uh, method actor. I think he was just a little bit more egocentric. You well, know, everybody he's, has. He's coming, I off mean, of, he's coming off of Rocky. He's coming off of Rambo. There is only one Stallone at this point. I mean, he's exactly. pretty much second to none. In, exactly. In terms of these kind of genre But pictures. every... But, like, but, you know, yeah, and... I, yeah. But you got to look at it like this. Every blockbuster actor has one of those movies. Um, every blockbuster actor has one of those movies at one point. Because, I mean, look at Christian Bale. He comes from the Dark Knight to doing Terminator Salvation and having a meltdown. You know, you know, you took down the lights! You know, that kind of deal. I mean, everybody uh, has one of those movie like every box office yeah, star I mean, yeah. has one of those movies everybody where has their ego it's a, i mean kevin costner water world you know everybody has one of those productions where it's like it, you have you know the director's doing one thing the star wants to do another the writer wants to do this but and, you got to figure like at this point in stallone's career i mean he could pretty much write his own tickets it, it probably was a situation of whatever you want mr stallone you are brilliant mm-hmm. and you know because i you also read about complaints from uh, cinematographer uh, Rick Waite, who said that, uh, you know, Stallone w- was causing delays because he would just be messing around with Bridget Nielsen. Again, they were dating at the time of this movie was in production. And uh, I guess uh, they actually had a confrontation that went pretty ugly. And Stallone also was... I guess regarded as the director of the movie to a lot of people, saying that uh, George P. Uh, Cosmateus, Cosmateus. Let's just call him George. Let's just call him George. Okay, so George, <laughs> uh, the director of the film, um, good producer but bad director, as Stallone, I guess, yeah, uh, but really kind of it, instilled in the crew's. Yeah, mind but the and, thing is, I I think one of the but of course George, again, Stallone himself coming off of Rambo and Rocky, uh, George is probably most successful movie. It's being what, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, exactly, and the thing is with that movie, you gotta remember that it, back in the eighties, if your movie made X amount of money, that was a ton of money to make. Now, Rambo, First Blood Part Two, and Rocky Four both made over a hundred million dollars at the box office. Back then, that was a that was compared to compared to like now, it would be like three hundred to four hundred million. That meant like everyone went to go see your movie or went to go see it more than once. And, you know, and if you really, like, break it down, and I know this is going to sound a little bit controversial, but if you really break it down, I mean, Rambo First Blood Part Two and Rocky IV, compared to their first movies, were not really, you know, full of depth. I mean, they were just like... I mean, no, and, and Rambo I- two is, you know, the action fest that First Blood wasn't, and Rocky IV was, you know, the, you know, you know, it was, he wasn't an underdog anymore. He was, I'm going to avenge, you know, Creed and I'm going to, yeah, you know. I, I think, I think that's what Menachem and Yoram were cashing in on mm-hmm. by producing Cobra was that a movie so basic like that without really any sense of depth can be a major blockbuster, and that's really what they were looking for. I also, I have my suspicions that Cobra was made as kind of like a, a deal made through canon where, okay, I'll do over the top for you eventually, but first got to do this Cobra movie. Mm-hmm. Christopher Reeve had a very similar deal Yeah. Um, when he worked for canon. But uh, again, because when you, when you read about the production of Cobra, you can see like just Stallone all over it, and Stallone in not a very flattering light to himself because he was pretty much just like bragging that he mm-hmm. is Stallone and, le- and letting everybody know he's Stallone, just kind of sauntering around. Hell, the uh, 1950 Mercury that Cobra drives in the movie was owned by Stallone. That was his own personal car mm-hmm. that he felt that his character needed to drive. Um, My character needs an awesome car. And he needs an awesome entrance. Exactly. Which, you know, now that we're getting, you know, we've talked about the production, like, like actually, like, you know, talk about the movie. 
our hero has one of the most badass entrances on film. Yeah. It, so badass that it was recreated for the Sponge, the first SpongeBob SquarePants movie. I mean, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, frame by frame. I mean, <laughs> this was a successful movie. It was. And I think people forget that when it was released in 86, it took the number one spot. It made 50 million. Critically, it didn't really uh, help. But it was a financial success, and I'm surp- I'm really surprised. But who listens at, to critics? <laughs> at, the, at the height of franchises, it's almost kind of a uh, resurgence of today, where franchises are more greenlit than uh, single movies are. So I'm surprised we didn't get a Cobra sequel. Well, sequels were only I think at that point sequels were only made if your movie made a lot of money at the box office, and by a lot, like. Over a hundred million dollars, you know. Ghostbusters had a sequel because that movie took in like over two hundred million. I mean, you can't compare. It, I mean, well, like, no, you can't. Ghostbusters. No, you can't. But at the same time, you got to think of you know the time. Everything was mass marketed to the masses. It wasn't you know. It wasn't like today where it was all about superheroes and you know I'm going to buy as many book series as I can to make into a new movie. You know, back then, they just made movies, you know, mm. kind of, sort of. They still had franchise movies. I mean, come on, Indiana Jones and all that. And But this was also near the end of the 80s where sequels were not as common, unless it was a horror movie. Sequels weren't, like, this was what, 87? This was 86. 86? This, this predated over the top. Yeah, this was 86. Sequel, I mean, the only really big sequel to come out in 86 was Aliens. And, you know, a few other harm. I mean, you had, uh, you know, Friday the 13th, uh, Jason Lives. Um, but that's really about, I mean, unless you were a horror or a sci-fi movie, you really didn't get a sequel. Unless, you know, and that's the way it, it kind of is. So, you know, the fact that we didn't get a Cobra sequel is the fact that maybe, you know, there were, it, Stallone was, exo- you know, maybe... It was such a bad experience for Stallone that he was like, I don't want to ever touch Cobra again. I mean, I don't want to ever do another, you know, I just want to do, you know, I don't want, I just want to do another Rambo after this. Maybe it didn't make as much money as they thought it would. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, this movie gets criticized a lot for, um, its plot or should I say lack thereof? Cause uh, on the whole, you look at it and it's pretty much just a series of actions uh, scenes one after another. Um, the the ba- the plot is very basic, where you have a girl played by Bridget Nielsen witnesses a murder from this gang of uh, cult following uh, killers. They see them kill a innocent woman. She sees them kill an innocent woman, and uh, she has to go into witness protection, led by Officer Marion Cobretti. Yes, that's his name. <laughs> and that's uh, the running joke in the movies that he has a really weak name and he's such a tough cop. And who goes by the nickname Cobra, um, and that's pretty much it. It's, we named the dog Indiana, <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of. Uh, and that's pretty much it as far as the plot goes. It's you know, uh, it's a witness protection movie. Mm-hmm. It's a uh, you know, got to get uh, the girl to safety, and of course, you throw in the unrequited love, the, the two characters falling for each other, meaning Cobra and Bridget Nielsen's character Ingrid, and. Um, you know, a ruthless killer, and then the ultimate showdown at the end. Car chases in between, and guns, and... Well, you have to show the important bits. The important bits are the action bits. Exactly. But that's what I'm saying, is like, you know, there's, as far as a story or a character arc, there's not really much to it. It's just literally a Mm -hmm. series of action scenes. Um, To me, that's not that bad. I'm gonna say, that's... I mean, because you kind of know, getting into a movie called Cobra... Where the poster is literally Stallone being a badass with, with his, a gu- with a yeah. you know semi automatic Uzi or yeah, whatever. He's just like and you know uh, in you know when you have ta- it, the tagline, which is a line in the movie, it's like you know, crime is the disease, meet the cure. I mean, Cobra. Cobra. Exactly. Cobra knows exactly what it's trying to be. Whereas compared to Over the Top, they're trying to trick you into thinking that it's more than it really is. <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I'm convinced two great things called Cobra came out of the 80s. This and G.I. Joe. I was wondering when <laughs> the G.I. Joe reference was going to come up. But yes. Cobra retreats! <laughs> um, 
But getting to, you know, getting to some of the one-liners, you know, because the work... The worst one-liner comes at the end. And uh, <laughs> though the ones listening to this podcast will know what one we're talking about, we added it in the beginning only because this one-liner is so unremarkably bad. And I and I can only assume it was Stallone who wrote it, trying to be a little <laughs> bit more relevant than he wanted to be. And This is where the law stops and I start. Sucker. Nice pause. <laughs> both on. You, had, you had one... Where, yeah, it's a very cheesy one-liner, but maybe you should have quit while you're ahead when he says sucka. Um, <laughs> not even sucker, or just sucka. Sucka. And, uh... <laughs> sounds like Booker, sounds sounds like Booker like, T from WCW. I know, just... just what? We're gonna get you, sucker! <laughs> and, uh... It's... You know, you got you got Brian Thompson pre-annihilation. Pre, yeah, pre-Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Well, no, not necessarily that. Pre-Mortal Kombat... And like all the other TV bits he would do. I mean, like yeah, 90s, I mean, he. Like Highlander. The first time I saw him show up in a movie was Terminator as one of those uh, punk guys that uh, Schwarzenegger steals clothes from. In the he hung game. out with Bill Paxton? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, Wash day tomorrow, that guy. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, you, you know, when you go, go into a movie like this, because again, like, I'm not as. Like, it's not, like, over the top where I'm just like, oh, man, this movie is just, ugh. Yeah, you got something, it's, like, over the top where you can literally just spend hours. We only spend a half hour, but we could spend hours oh just God, tearing into it. what is wrong it. with this thing? Just tearing into it. Whereas Cobra, it's just, it's... Cobra, it's just like... And, but you know what? It's that, a movie. But, but you know what? That almost might go against it. You know, is it, you know, quick and painless? Sure. But do you really remember anything that happens in it at the same time? I, I mean, just remember how the bad guy is dispatched by way of, like, somebody, I'm convinced, somebody watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the whole thing with, you know, taking somebody and putting them on a hook and said, okay, I like that, but let's add fire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and at a time when Cannon was, you know, securing people like Toby Hooper to make sequels to Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. you can see where they're being inspired. But, I mean, like, in terms of, like, memorability of, you know, do you remember, like, a really good, emotionally driven scene between actors in this movie? Because I can tell you, no. Um, the one scene, well... But, but, I mean, you got the love scene. I mean, that... No, the that, one scene so I do like... Well, some of the... by numbers. Well, some of the... You know, because being a cop show and a cop movie fan myself, I think one of the, the scenes... I like the beginning of the movie because it's, you know, it's old school. You know, you get the bad... You know, you got the bad guy inside. I got hostages! I want this and that! And then it's like, all right, send the Cobra in, takes the bad guy down. And then he's outside with all the reporters. And the reporter's like, D doesn't he have rights? Doesn't he have rights? And then he just grabs the reporter by the head, shoves his face in a, you know, one of the victims of uh, this guy who just went on a shotgun rampage. It's like, tell that to his family. Let's the guy go. So, yeah, there's some social <laughs> commentaries in moments like that. But talking about that convenience store scene, which is like the first scene in the movie, and it's when we get introduced into our main character of Cobra, the product placement. Oh my in that god! Seen a little, okay, you can make the argument that it is a convenience store. There's products in there, but come on, that guy. We linger up. on Bartles and he hides behind Bartles and James. Oh my parts and apart. It's unrealistic. I mean, the guy <laughs> on duty trying to stop a terrorist who has dozens of hostages in the store takes a moment to crack open a cores, <laughs> take a sip, and throw it. <laughs> To create a distraction. I mean, if that's not product placement, I don't know what is. There's not Pepsi free. Pepsi. It's like literally. You th there's a display of a Pepsi can being poured into a Pepsi cup of Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi, Pepsi Coors. Pepsi, Pepsi Coors. RC, RC Cola. Seven up. Seven up. <laughs> you got almost every beverage known to man. The only thing that's in. depressing is not once did I see Tab. No. One yeah. of my favorite sodas, and not once did I see a tab can. I thought this was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> not once did I see uh, a tab. Oh, my God. It's just the product placement. It's like, and not only that, but, he, but here's the thing. He did teach you how to eat pizza. You, you take it out of the leftover pizza. You take it out of the freezer. You cut it with scissors, and you eat the tip. You just <laughs> yum, yum, yum. <laughs> 
Yeah, not to mention, you know, the perfect place to keep your gun cleaning equipment in the refrigerator in a egg carton. <laughs> The Cobretti way. He doesn't play. He doesn't play by the rules. Look, and and, and he, those are his rules. He even has yeah. a computer. Yeah, it's true. Before <laughs> There's got to be a deleted scene of Cobra using a Vic Twenty. Yeah, <laughs> he's also obsessed with his uh, partner's diet and how he eats too much junk food. And of course, you know, you know, you're... Still, this was during Stallone's really. Uh, kind of health craze where he was eating nothing but fish, chicken, and rice to drop weight for these movies. You know what your problem is? What? You're too, too violent. violent. It's the junk food you eat, man. It's all the sugar you put in your body. Maybe eat a plum. Try the plums. <laughs> Very good. So, you know, you get the PSA in there. It's like, don't eat as much junk food. But junk the, food bad. But the, but, but the question is, is like, this just kind of like funny character tropes or is this the character? <laughs> like, is this our look into who this man is? And all this man really is, is a cop who plays by his own rules, loves health food and keeps his gun cleaning, if, if he gun is cleaning a health, equipment in questionable if he places. Is a, if he is a health food nut, why is the only thing we see him eat is pizza? Yes, but he cuts it in half with a pair of scissors. I don't know why he doesn't <laughs> own a knife, but who knows? It's a pair of scissors. And uh, he eats the small half. <laughs> he does eat the small half, so you know it's it's <laughs> carb loading, but at a very low level. You guys carbs for the day. Exactly. That well, was technically, his... you know, that, people have regarded pizza as a full meal because you got your meat, you got your cheese, you got your sauce, and you got your bread. You got your veggies, your carb, and your protein. <laughs> But you digress, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... I'm, I'm like thinking, a man! You eat your pizza like a man! <laughs> but, I, 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 but I think the point being is they're trying to build character into this very <laughs> characterless cobra. And what kind of, you know, passes for funny character quirks, they're trying to make it into a, you know, relatable guy. I can't relate to Cobra, but on any level, I do not cut my pizza with scissors. But you don't. Do I, I don't even own a weapon, but if I did, I would not keep the cleaning equipment in an egg carton, you know, or drive a 1950 Mercury. With, Maybe he likes... That's also, by the way, tricked out. You'll see in the car <coughs> scene, it's, it's, it's almost like a Batmobile of, of uh, police proportions. <laughs> In a 1950 Do you think this was his audition tape for 1989's Batman? Yeah. Sylvester Stallone is Batman. I'm pretty sure he was considered for Batman. Oh, God. I know he was considered for Superman in 1978. Yo, Lois. <laughs> well, you got to remember, in 1976, he was high. He was being he was actually regarded because of Rocky as being, like, a top player, you know. I, you got to love the trailers for Rocky when they're, like, comparing him to Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro. Yeah. And, like, you think about it now, you're like, fucking Stallone? Um, anyway, well, here's a, well, here's the thing with uh, here's another thing to add to the product placement. Notice how this is set at Christmas. It is. It's it's mm. it's Christmas in L.A. So you mm. don't question why there's no snow, but I'm starting to question why it wasn't. Um, Where's John McClane and Riggs and Murtaugh? <laughs> right. And, well, I was just about to say I'm starting to question why Shane Black didn't write this movie. Oh my God, his upset. Well, the, you know that was you know you didn't really have Christmas movies in the '80s. You had action movies that were Christmas movies. And this is a bona fide action movie <laughs> that's just set around Christmas. Oh my god. Some of the action scenes in this movie. I mean I mean he I mean this movie Driving backwards while shooting with an Uzi. But you know what? For a movie um that is ultimately I think forgotten. I mean this isn't really a movie that gets brought up a lot today. However, it inspired a lot. You mentioned the SpongeBob SquarePants reference, which is kind of hilarious if you know and seen Cobra. Um but also, uh, the movie Drive was yeah. inspired by Cobra, and that got a lot of critic acclaim, mm -hmm. and um, not so much box office, but a lot of critical and, acclaim. And, and, and as I was just, I was just mentioning about uh, Cobra's tricked out 1950 Mercury. There's a, a very prominent moment where he flips a switch of nitrous, and I can only assume the Fast and the Furious people Could be. took note of that. Well, I think that you know, it's it has its. You know, it's one of those movie, those movies that it flies under the radar just enough to where people can pick up on it and insert it into their own work. 
You know, that's that's a great movie. If you could pick up so on... So it's almost like, like a, people don't remember this, so I can probably try to make it fresh again. Yeah. it's Well, it's like, you know, the you know when I saw the other guys with uh, Will Ferrell and uh, Marky Mark there, you know, it's it, that's supposed to be a parody of cop movies. Much It's a much better parody than Cop Out is. Um, but, you know, you go into Marky Mark's house and there's a Cobra poster on the wall. Yeah, exactly. And I saw yeah. that I'm like, hey, nice, nice poster. Yeah, so, I mean, <laughs> it's still regarded in pop culture as being a bona fide cop movie, but it's not really recognizable as, say, a Die Hard, which they're still making, or a Lethal Weapon, mm-hmm. which were really popular in its day. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, it, I mean... I, it's a cop movie from the east, and there was a ton of them. I mean, you had. I mean, I can understand the criticisms of it. I can understand, you know, the lack of plot. I can understand uh, the no character depth in in Stallone's character. Um, one critic like referred to him as just like a hulking, silent, kind of empty shell of a cop. Um, and so, Not unlike Dirty Harry. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, you could almost kind of make the argument that's almost like what Stallone was trying to play. Yeah, like, Dirty this, Harry. This was his Dirty Harry. And and that was big in the 80s because you got to remember, Dirty Harry, had, Dirt, the Dirty Harry had like, uh, how many sequels? Exactly. Like five? Mm-hmm. And, you know, ended in the early 90s, which, hey, with the nostalgia craze that's going on, I won't be surprised if, we, if Clint Eastwood's like, what would Dirty Harry be like at his old age? <laughs> you know. So I guess I guess in closing for me, I would say Cobra. Um, you know, when I was younger, I was really into this movie. Looking back on it now, in terms of this podcast, I can say it doesn't really hold up. It's not really you know something that is memorable, mm-hmm. something that you think about. You know, because you you sit through a viewing of Cobra, you're pretty much thinking about something else. Not even five minutes after it's are over, um, but. Kind of like how I said about Over the Top, in terms of the canon library, it's pretty harmless. It was a successful movie. It was a number one movie. It made $50 million. So it should be at least regarded as that. Um, it's a movie that made money for canon. It's And it's just fun. You know, it I mean, is. It's, 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 it's entertaining. It's not so, I don't think it's really supposed to be It's an entertaining seriously. movie. It's an entertaining movie because if, you know... You don't I mean, some action movies. You, it's an action movie. It's an action. It's a bona fide action, action movie. movie. You go for the explosions and for the action. You go to get your heart racing and you you know to grip the edge of your you know your seats and be like, oh my god, what's gonna happen next? And you know, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of people need to take that in consideration, especially now with you know some of the action movies that come out that aren't superhero movies. Um. But, you know, in terms of me, in, clo- in closing thoughts for me, I like Cobra. I mean, it's not a, it's not a masterpiece of cinema. Well, though, I, don't think I, I don't think anything in canon is, so if you're looking for that with this uh, podcast, uh, you're uh, not going to get it. Uh, uh, you haven't seen Othello yet. That's for another, <laughs> that's that, for another episode. That's you for haven't another seen day. Othello yet. Um, and that'll be for a future episode. But at the same time, you know, it's not a masterpiece of cinema, but at the same time, you go for an act. It's a Stallone action movie. It's not one of his best. I would probably put a few others above this one if we're ranking them. In terms of Stallone. In yes. terms of Stallone but, Stallone, movies. but based on this episode, in terms of Stallone's canon days, as in his two movies produced by Menachem and Yoram, I would say Cobra was first and, and top. The, and the best. Yes. Because my, if we're comparing this to Over the Top... Oh, yeah. yeah. I'd rather be stuck on an island with this movie on repeat. Because you can just have fun with Cobra, whereas over the top, yeah, really, it's a head scratcher at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, oh my God. <laughs> it's, you go into this movie, I, I just thought, it, I just thought of something. It's like, you go into this movie, it's like, you know, okay, we got, we got to have the tropes there. You know, who do we get for the police cap- captain? Get Art LaFleur! Okay, yeah, you got your, you got the. You know, we need a weasel. You got the standard uh, cop movie, you, you know, tropes. Get yeah, that yeah. Robinson guy and, from and Hellraiser. Art LaFleur, you know, exactly. In, in, in terms of that, the movie is perfect at what it does. Mm-hmm. All right, so I think that's going to do it for this episode of Masters of Boogaloo. If you this want, pilot episode. Exactly. <laughs> this is our first one, and if you enjoyed it, keep listening. And if you want to hit us up, for any canon movies that you want us to talk about on the podcast, we're also thinking about branching off and doing full-length commentaries on canon movies. 
there's something you want us to address or talk about, hit us up at mastersofboogaloo at gmail.com. In closing, I'm Aaron M. Lambert. I'm Kyle Murphy. Take it easy.